One of the biggest takeaways from my interview with Han Zhao was understanding segmentation and hierarchical embeddings. When we have these embeddings for real world objects, we don't want to just have one embedding for the entire object. We typically want to decompose it into uh, nested levels. And the Gina AI doc array is a great example for how you really implement this and bring this to life. So maybe to have a motivating example, I've been working on uh, training language models on these Keras code examples. And you can imagine decomposing this into structures where you have, say, this text segment, this code segment, and maybe it references a paper or something like that. And you see how it has like text code snippets, comment code. You can imagine like nesting this instead of just having, say, one embedding for this entire Keras code example wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense. So in order to implement this idea of how we have granular embeddings, we divide our real world objects into segments and subparts that we want to search through, as well as enable describing our objects with multiple kinds of data types. So as just a random example, say you're trying to describe a house and you have images of the house, you have a text description for say a real estate agent listing, you have the graph structured representation of the neighborhood, and maybe you also have a tabular feature that describes properties of the house, maybe you have a video of like a virtual reality tour or something. This kind of multimodal idea of representing objects is something that I think will just become more and more prolific as you know more and more people are using deep learning and as this technology advances. So let's understand how the Gina AI doc array makes it really easy to work with multimodal data as well as to segment it up to have granular embeddings for search. So the quick intro on the website for Gina AI, what is Docarray? It's like JSON, but for intensive computation, it's like numpy.ndarray, but for unstructured data. It's like pandas.dataframe, but for nested and mixed media data with embeddings. It's like protobuf, but for data scientists and deep learning engineers. So that kind of gives you a sense of what it is. And I think probably uh, more importantly, we'll be just getting a quick look at the the, the core primitive, which is the document, and then understanding how you assemble documents into the document array. And then let's jump right into the examples to try to bring it home. So we begin with the document, the basic data type in Docarray, the core primitive in which we're going to be storing our objects. So we see with the constructor we just have from Docarray import document, D equals document. And so now the way that we are going to be setting the values of D after we did D equals document is very uh, Pythonic, like a Python dictionary, these kind of objects where you have these attributes and you just say uh, D dot tensor equals if you just want to like directly assign uh, like an image to your document or you know the text you you would label it with the granularity and adjacency but let's save that for when we're looking at how we assemble them in document array and this is coming back to that idea of hierarchical nesting chunking up the objects and having the granularity to search through but um so we, we can have things like the modality like text image things like that uh, chunks are the sub documents again it's recursive both horizontally and vertically but we'll save that for looking at the um, at the document array. So the embedding is going to be the vector embedding of the document and kind of coming back to Weavia, Weavia would be a, a vector database. So you want to have persistence of these embeddings, you want to have a full a full fledged database with create, read, update, delete, support, as well as this HNSW algorithm as you really look to search through a massive scale of embeddings. But so you do D dot embedding and then you know pass to the embedding that way or you can just have this call where you um, where you say like um, training images dot embed and then you pass in the model as an argument and it will use that model to embed the entire uh, data set, the entire collection in the document array. So before we graduate from the document to the collection in the document array, let's quickly understand this image to further understand the idea of the document primitive. So we have any data type, this could be an image, a video, an audio file, a text document, whatever it is. Uh, so we, we populate the document with this content. So uh, if it's text, you could just write dot text you might want to put it into uh, like a NumPy array and then do dot tensor and write it into that. I think that might be the best way to have, say, with say you have tabular data, I'm thinking it might be best to put it into the vector of the tabular features after you've pre-processed it and all that kind of stuff. Or you could use these tags to describe the tabular data, but that might not be so amenable to the way that you do the vector embedding. So I'd recommend if you're working with tabular data to, uh, to write that in the dot tensor part of it. But anyway, so you populate these different things as again, we looked at at the different things that you would populate, the different attributes of a document, uh, then you would add this side information or metadata or uh, say symbolic filters to the data. And uh, in Weaviate, we love how in the HNSW algorithm, the way that it's been implemented in Weaviate, you can add symbolic filters to your search. And it's an interesting thing for say you want to label the data source. If you're doing a text search and you want to, to maybe come back to these Keras code examples, say you're searching for Keras information, but uh, you only want to search through Kaggle notebooks that have implemented some idea or 
maybe you only want to search for through GitHub repositories. So these are kind of like symbolic filters that you would use on your uh, on your data sources and on your vector search. So you can imagine all kinds of symbolic filters that might be relevant to how what you're doing. So this is one kind of idea of adding that meta information as well as the embedding. So you also have these uh, chunks and matches. So chunks and matches is probably the best transition to the next idea. As we look at the uh, the recursive horizontal and vertical structure in these document arrays. Thank you for making it this far in the video. This is where I think things get really interesting. So now we have the document array. We're going to be assembling these document document primitives into the collection of documents that we're going to be searching through. So what's interesting about this firstly is the way that we have chunks and matches. So the way that we construct this tree like structure where you signal what objects are on the same level as this object as well as the subparts of the of the um, of the object so i think what describes it well is uh it describes they describe their uh, ways of traversing these trees uh, indexing by nested structure okay sorry here it is okay so this illustrates really how you form this so say r is your real world object i guess to come back to the house let's say r is the house so m and c m are matches so Say this is a house, this is a house, this is a house, and you're at the top level of your hierarchy of abstraction. So you're, this is a match, and this is also a match. And these chunks, you might say these chunks are, uh, maybe out they're matches with each other, I think, is the way that you kind of would set that up, and uh, maybe it might help also to, <laughs> to go a little deeper into the recursion of the tree. And you see how this chunk has these two matches. So if this chunk is, um, you know, matched with this chunk, I guess, or so something like that from some other object, you have that kind of flexibility to uh, write it like that. And maybe this abstraction isn't something that I haven't quite wrapped my head around yet, but I can see how you have this flexibility to design this kind of data structure where you can you know, infinitely match it horizontally with say other houses, or uh, let's say that it's scientific papers are R and the, um, the, first level, the first chunk are abstracts of the scientific paper. So you would match the abstracts horizontally with other abstracts and then vertically, you're going from scientific paper uh, down to abstract. So hopefully that made some sense. But so this is kind of how you have that kind of nested structure of the objects. And now to really get uh, more interesting, let's look into kind of the neural information retrieval components that have been implemented in the Gina AI doc array. So quickly before doing that, I think I can give a better explanation of dividing up this a scientific paper into this kind of idea of matches and chunks. So we have a scientific paper and say naturally we decompose it into abstract introduction related works, experiment, so on. And then within say introduction, we wanna chunk the introduction object into the, the paragraphs. So I, I think that makes some sense. So we, at the first level of the hierarchy, scientific papers, one step below that on the tree, abstract introduction related works. These are all on the same level, say, uh, they're not. I don't think they're matches with each other quite yet because they're uh, they don't reference the same kind of object when you're searching for another scientific paper. So you only want to search through uh, introductions for your entire data set of scientific papers. And then within the uh, introduction, as you're at the second level of tree of the tree, to so to go make it the third level of the tree, you're breaking it up into the paragraphs. So hopefully that's a better understanding of this kind of idea. But I think personally, just as I continue to use this, hopefully I'll be able to provide a better explanation of this overall. So anyways, let's transition into embedding these uh, documents with a neural network and turning them into vectors that have been optimized with some task, whether it's supervised learning or whether it's self-supervised, most commonly self-supervised contrastive learning produces these embeddings. And that's kind of the recent breakthrough in deep learning generally is the success of these contrastive learning algorithms and their ability to learn semantic vectors and plug these vectors into a similarity search engine. So what we have with PyTorch is you see how you have this kind of syntax where the dimensionality of the output is 32 uh, with Keras similarly 32. Uh, you can also say, you know, you optimize your Keras model and you name this layer. So uh, in my experiments with ResNet 50, my penultimate layer, dense layer is named ResNet vectors. So I say vector model equals tf.keras model inputs equals, you know, the input and then out and then get layer by name resnet vectors output anyways. So that's how you get the model to produce the vectors. And then when you have your document array, you just call uh, docs. Docs is the document array object, obviously. So <laughs> docs.embed, and then you pass in the model as the argument, and then you get the vectors for everything in your document array. So this is how you do that, and I think that's super powerful. So from there alone, you've got the, um, you've got the embeddings from a neural network for your 
uh, for your data types and now you can do matching nearest neighbor. So you have two options, you have match and find. Uh, so I think the difference is is uh, left-hand side, right, right-hand side. So this is your 1 million docs, your doc array, and then query is your single instance that you've put into a vector space. So you do this dot find query or query dot match. Two ways of doing it, I'm not exactly sure what the difference is. So we've seen the basic object of the document, how to compose them into the document array. Hopefully you got a solid preview of this idea of the nesting and how you can chunk up the objects and divide them that way and add your search that way. We saw how to bring in a neural network from PyTorch or Keras. I think there are two other as well that I ignored, but uh, two other as well as if you know how to do that. I personally don't, so I left it out. Uh, and then we saw how to call the find and match functions to match the nearest neighbors. And now let's look at evaluating matches. So this is super important if you're going to be, you know, writing research papers or, you know, developing systems, you have these metrics implemented in Gina AI to, you know, get a score to see how well this is doing and then you can improve the system. So uh, what you're doing is you have a ground truth ranking. You have rankings of what you think are the nearest neighbor. So, and this is super interesting with respect to labeling this because I think, you know, labeling ranking can be extremely fuzzy. Imagine doing that for like CIFAR 10 image search. How are you going to, you know, say that these are the nearest neighbor? This is like the ground truth. It's kind of a funny thing to do. And, but anyway, so there are definitely things, especially, I mean, with text information retrieval, it's very obvious. Or, well, I guess even then there's like, quite the space of determining a rank order, but this is one of the kind of topics in the space of neural information retrieval. But here are some of the metrics they've implemented. You have uh, hit at K, recall at K, F1 score at K. These are some of the metrics uh, once you have passed in a ground truth ranked list, and then you can compare that, uh, that match, the output of match, by putting it into this DA predict.evaluate and this kind of function to evaluate these systems. So maybe to wrap up the video, let's come back to the original description, what is a document array? So we see how it's like JSON, the way it has this kind of open-ended structure that lets you just kind of be very flexible with the way you uh, add your objects. You can imagine you have a scientific paper at that R node at the top of the branch, and then you uh, chunk it up into abstract introduction, and then say even within introduction you could switch data types, like you could have text and then you could add the image of a figure, you know, or say a table, table question, tables are also a huge part of this kind of uh, search thing if you want to make the example of scientific papers, is the thing that guides your thinking about neural search, but but anyway, so coming down to it, it's like numpy.nd array, but for unstructured data, we saw how it has this uh, integration of these functions, so kind of like with numpy arrays, how you say maybe like I don't know, numpy.1s or uh, something like numpy.sum, you know, how you can like sum along these matrices or, you know, they implement all sorts of like matrix opera operations like that that are also, uh, you know, parallelized. So it's like way faster than say looping through it and things like that. So you see how they have these functions that are like built into the data object, which makes it different from JSON because JSON is not like, you know, you don't have like callable functions within a JSON data structure, but Anyway, so I think that's kind of also the explanation of why it's like pandas dot data frame. Similarly, like it stores your data and then it also has like the functions to process it. So this is my early understanding of Doc Array. I've been, you know, I've just got started working with Gina AI and I absolutely love it. I think it's so interesting and I can't wait to advance my own personal understanding and share these lessons on Henry AI Labs as well as the Weave 8 podcast. So I really hope you find this interesting and, you know, check out Gina AI for yourself. I think probably the best way to learn these things is to just get started doing it yourself. And they have these examples. You can, you know, I think the CFAR 10 image data set is a great way to start with this. So I hope you enjoy this and I hope this gave you enough to get a sense of what's going on here. This video is a part of a series breaking down the key topics and lessons from our interview with Han Zhao, CEO of Gina AI. Please check out Semi Technologies on YouTube to see the full length podcast, as well as a tutorial showing you how to integrate Weviate and Gina AI for fashion image similarity search. Mm -hmm.